Thank you very much. Thank you to the Secure World Foundation for the opportunity to be your last speaker of the day. Uh, I see opportunities and challenges to that. Uh, one opportunity being there's no speaker behind me. So this little clock over here I really feel is more of a non-binding guideline <laughs> rather than legally binding. The challenge being I'm pretty sure everybody has said all of the talking points that I wanted to say today. So I'm really just going to try to uh, sum up. Now I had some slides. If those could be pulled up. There we go. Excellent. Great. Uh, and so I just want to uh, talk about a couple items today. Obviously the impact of ASAT testing on space sustainability, uh, but then also the seven principles that the United States has put forward at the open-ended working group. You heard General Shaw say that we have, that the Department of Defense has five. Well, the U.S. government coordinated position actually is seven. So I'm happy to announce that for the first time ever, the State Department has more of something than the Department of Defense. <laughs> and just so you all stay around, number four might surprise you. Come on. There we go. All right. Uh, this is something we've all heard a lot about today is the outer space environment. You all know these points uh, quite well, right? The number of spacecraft in, in orbit is increasing exponentially. There are more and more actors in space. Uh, space is incredibly important for the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is responsible. It is part of all of those. Uh, revenue, the amount of money that you can generate, the amount of money being spent on outer space is growing and it can, will continue to grow. Um, but part of that also is that space is becoming more competitive, more congested. And in this current environment of tension and mistrust, uh, it is important that we take tangible and concrete steps to address the risks that could lead to a conflict or negatively impact the long-term sustainability of outer space. And like my colleague from uh, Leo Labs, I, I wanted to talk about some of the data that we see out there. You know, this graphic, which is courtesy of my NASA colleagues, really shows what happens when you have an intentional destruction. You see number one there, that big jump being the Chinese ASAT test in 2007. And then number three there is the Russian ASAT test from November 2021 with the striking of Cosmos 1408. Uh, and then as our colleague talked about, we have in the middle there Cosmos 2251 and Iridium 33 that collided in 2009. And as he also talked about, right, those two deliberate debris generating events are the two leading causes of fragmentation events in orbit. About 22% uh, of the debris on orbit today and results in pretty much 20% of the conjunction warnings in 2022. And in fact, according to the Space Command for the International Space Station, there were 1,486 conjunctions with the space station in 2022, which was a 233% increase from 2021, and that increase was largely conducted because of the debris from the anti-satellite missile test, and also required us to maneuver the International Space Station two times last year. And so, of course, that debris is going to reduce the life of satellites because they're using fuel to maneuver, is going to increase costs to companies, to governments, uh, and that is going to drive up the cost of using space. And that is something obviously we want to avoid. We want to drive down those costs so that more and more people can benefit from the use of outer space. And that's why uh, we feel like we needed to start that process of creating a stable and predictable situation in space to encourage that growth uh, and to enhance the security environment so that it was stable for all countries. As Audrey talked about, we worked very hard in the U.S. government interagency to draft and create the announcement that the Vice President made in April of 2022. We then decided that a great way to make it more multilateral 
was to take it to the United Nations and run it as a UN General Assembly resolution. My colleagues have talked about, uh, we, we say there are 155 countries. Uh, there's actually two votes in the United Nations. Uh, one is in the UN First Committee and then it gets promoted up to the UN General Assembly. And we had six countries between those two that voted yes there, but then didn't show up, and then another six there. So it really is somewhere around 161 countries that in total actually voted for it. We had the nine no's, Russia and China, and then their close allies, Cuba, Iran, Syria, Nigeria, all countries I'm happy to have vote no on that resolution. And we really do see that both as a first step and are looking at what our future steps can be. We can look at arms control. We talked about here uh, the internet governance as a model. Well, arms control is actually a model for how we can help enhance the sustainability of the outer space environment. In 1963, we passed the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons in orbit. Right. That is a first step at trying to work at the stain sustainability of the outer space environment. And when you think about that one, that is really the foundational arms control treaty that leads to a progression of treaties that reduce the amount of nuclear weapons testing. It leads to the partial test ban, I'm mean, sorry, the threshold test ban treaty. And then that leads eventually to a comprehensive test ban treaty and shows a progression and I get that everybody would like diplomacy to work very quickly, but it, it doesn't. It takes us some time to get all of this done. And we need to think about what does that progression look like. And in fact, at the same time as we passed the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1963, there was actually a UN General Assembly resolution that called on all countries to refrain from placing nuclear weapons in orbit. And I see that somewhat as a model for the work that we have done on the ASAT resolution. Just like in 1963, it took them about four years to get that into the actual Outer Space Treaty where it became a legally binding prohibition on the placement of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction in outer space. And we really need to think about like the impact of taking those most dangerous weapons off of the table. Could you imagine if we had nuclear weapons circling in orbit now? Could you imagine safely deorbiting a nuclear weapon at the end of its life. You know, when you think about 63, we're probably at the point where you would be thinking, wow, some of these nukes need to come down in a safe manner. We have the Conference on Disarmament also, which is trying to work on this. They have the, an issue on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. And also, one of the reasons why I am optimistic that diplomacy will make some progress in this is that we have this uh, UN body called the UN Disarmament Commission. And for a number of years, it's been looking at how to implement transparency and confidence building measures in outer space. And uh, as uh, I think Michael mentioned earlier, just uh, in the midst of this tension in this difficult environment, we actually were able to reach consensus on what some of these transparency and confidence building measures should be. So for the first time, countries have committed as a voluntary transparency measure to start doing pre-launch notifications of space launches. We have not had that before. We have agreements that they should start doing, uh, putting out their space policies, communicating with other countries. So uh, that potentially shows that there can be progress made as we think about next steps like the open-ended working group, which will meet to try to create recommendations in August of this year. Now there are technical challenges. I won't you know, downplay them, right? You know, what can a satellite do? It's very hard for us to know, you know, what is really actually capable of doing. And then even then, how do you know? How can you verify something in space? Very hard to get up there close and see it. What is it? Is it military? Is it civilian? Can it do both? It's hard to know that. And then we've talked a lot today about if we rush into a regulatory environment, especially a legally binding arms control treaty on space, it's most likely that we are going to unnecessarily constrain some of those capabilities like active debris removal or on-orbit servicing. Uh, and so that is why the United States is looking to promote our new seven norms of responsible behavior. We think these are a good first step for discussion among uh, the countries that are meeting at the open-ended working group. And there are some really, uh, for us, some very important new ideas contained in here. Uh, and so, for example, uh, states, number three, states should operate in, to, and from in a safe and professional manner. 
Now we need to figure out what safe and professional manner is, and that gets a bit to the provisions in the Outer Space Treaty of due regard. Let's start trying to figure out what safe and professional looks like. We know what unprofessional looks like here on Earth, whether it be with ships or aircraft. We have plenty of reminders of those interactions. As those interactions start to occur in outer space, we need to have figured out what safe and professional looks like. Number four, states should limit the creation of new debris. This one actually talks about countries should consider refraining from all experiments or activities that could result in the creation of debris, including the intentional creation of debris. So it goes a little bit beyond what our current direct descent ASAT commitment talks about and goes a step further. Uh, and then, of course, uh, states should avoid the creation of harmful interference. For the first time in a document, the US government has started to describe some of those activities that we think could be harmful interference. The Outer Space Treaty does not define it, but we talk about interference with uh, treaty monitoring capabilities in outer space, with command and control of satellites, with missile launch warning satellites. And so this is the start of an opportunity to really begin discussing those important definitions that could help communicate to countries about what our concerns are, but potentially try to reach agreement around our uh, conclusions. And so with that, I am definitely way out of time. Uh, and so let me just thank all of you for your work in this area. It is a really important topic, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues going forward. And thank you all for listening to me this afternoon.